Section 6, Modeling the Game. So now we're going to get into some serious modeling as we take on the game itself. In this section, we're going to model the game, we'll create, store, and retrieve the game model in Redis, and we'll also look at modeling a bag of game tiles, which, as you'll see, will be absolutely critical to our gameplay. Video 6.1, Understanding the Game. In this video, we'll need to dig into how users will interact with the game so we can understand the data access patterns. We'll also need to figure out what we actually need to track in the database as we move through the game. We'll need to gather all this information in order to create a usable design that works with Redis. To help us start developing our game model, let's look at what a game looks like from our player's point of view. So what steps do I take to start, play, and finish a game? Well, first, of course, I need to create a game with my friends. Now, once that game has started, at some point, I'll need to take a turn. Now, remember, the rules allow playing against the first or last letter of their word. So before I can take my turn, if I'm not first, I'll need to see the previous play to determine what letters are valid to play against. Okay. So now I look at my letter tray and try to form some good words. After much debate with myself, I finally choose a word to play. And I submit it. Now I draw new tiles to replace the ones that I just played for the next turn. And finally, at some point, I'll celebrate that I once again trounced my friends in a friendly game of word fling. So, wow, it's a lot of work to play a game. It seems we need to track a lot of stuff just to get to our sudden but inevitable win. But let's see how that looks as relationships. So you can see a game has a number of players, and each player has his or her own tray of letters. Now also, a game tracks the turns the player has taken. And of course, each turn was played by a player. But actually, so that's not too bad. But once again, the key to Redis's heart is defining your access patterns or reachability. So let's look at how we'll reference these game objects as we move through the gameplay. Now, first of all, we need to create the game. There's not a game ID yet, but we do need the list of players that are going to play. And after we create the game, then we'll have a game ID. Next, we need to see what happened in the last turn. Now we could use the turn ID to do this, but we don't necessarily even know that. And it will be changing with each turn anyway, so it's easier just to use the game ID here as well and figure it out from the list of turns. We need to check a player's tray of letters, so of course we'll need the game ID again, but now we'll also need a player ID. Then the player takes a turn. So, game ID, player ID. Finally, the player needs to draw replacement letters. Again, game ID and player ID. So can you see how the pattern breaks down here? Once we create the game, we'll use that game ID for accessing everything associated with the game. And in most cases, we'll also need to use the player ID to discriminate as we do have multiple players associated with the game. So now we have enough information to quickly model our game. We need to limit the gameplay, so we're going to start by having a bag of letter tiles that we randomly draw from. This is probably a good use for a Redis set. In fact, it even has a method for random access. Next, we need to track the players. Another set? Well, no, because we also need to track the order of play. A Redis list maintains order, but we don't need this list anywhere outside of the game context. In fact, it would just complicate things to do so. We would have to look that up. So let's just store a serialized string of player IDs, an array, in the game hash. Speaking of which, we'll need to track whose turn it is, so we'll track the current player on the game as well. Now, each player also has a set of letters to select from in his or her tray. And I'm tempted to use a set again here, and that would be a fine choice, but in the future, I'd like to be nice to my players and allow them to rearrange the letters in their tray. So I'm gonna go with a list, 
even if that means a little extra work on my part. And finally, we need to track all the turns that have been taken by the players. Since the turns happen in order, and each turn is fairly complex, we're going to store that as a list. So now we're good to start writing some code, and that's the subject for our next video, creating and storing a game.